Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Jamie Zimmer, an old friend of mine. Jamie is a fifth degree black belt in Aikido, the founder of Kiai Golf. She's been a golf professional. She's a corporate conference speaker. Uh, she's founders of Middle East, one of the founders of the Middle East Aikido Peace Project. She's worked in women's martial arts. She's got a BA from Stanford, uh, marriage counselor, sports counselor, somatic certifications, as long as your arm, body worker, all kinds of things. Jamie, welcome. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> good to it be here. Nice, it's nice to see you again. It's been a little while since we chatted, and it's, it's good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Mm-hmm. So let me dive in. What, how did you get interested in the body? I think I was born in the body. <laughs> I think it was a, something I just sort of felt naturally. I was, a, I was a little tomboy girl, I think you could say. So I was really athletic right from the start. I started playing golf when I was seven, and it was way back when. There were no instructors at the time. That, hardly any junior golf programs. It's nothing like it was today. And it was just like my brother played, a couple other kids played, that was it. So I just went out there and just sort of naturally swing golf club, just went boom, boom. And I was what you would call a natural. And I think I just sort of kind of had it in my body. I was also smart, uh, you know, from the school point of view. So, I mean, I was doing multiplication and division in kindergarten and I wrote books even when I was in first grade. I used to take my dad's the cardboard from my dad's shirts it came back from the laundry and make the, sh- the book covers out of it. Hmm. So, you know, and it was, so what I'm saying about that is I think I just sort of, when I was young, had this mind body thing going on. Uh, I was sort of like the scholar athlete when I was about four or five years old, I think. Or, and uh, so, you know, I just think being, being so physical all my life kind of got me tuned into it. And then when I was in college, I was at Stanford and my, my uh, friend told me about Aikido, which I can't claim any consciousness, shall we say, around starting Aikido. It's not like I was looking for a martial art or looking for a spiritual practice or looking for self-defense or looking for personal growth. I don't think I even knew what those things were at the time. <laughs> she just told me about this beautiful art where the teacher spoke in metaphors of nature and everybody was, was cooperative in the way they practice instead of real competitive. And I was like, oh yeah, that's no way too good to be true so I kind of went very cynically also because you could get a college credit and sure enough this art was incredible and it really did embody so much again I didn't know what that word was at the time but as I started practicing Aikido it felt really really familiar to me and I think whatever that thing is that I was sort of born knowing that allowed me to just be a natural athlete and a natural golfer and um it, it just was sort of all there in Aikido. And then as I started to learn, shall we say more, about, about the body, about psychology, about spirituality, about, you know, about empowerment, all those things, I was like, oh, my God, it starts dawning on me that this is what it's all about. And it started giving me, <clears throat> I would say, tools and language and practices to understand what I was sort of born knowing. And then after that, it sort of revealed itself that, hmm, this is kind of a calling. <laughs> yeah, and you really threw yourself into the Aikido, didn't you? Oh, all the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I-, I was lucky. I mean, Duran Sensei, Frank Duran Sensei taught five days a week at Stanford. It was noon class every day. And then he taught Mondays and Fridays in San Francisco. He taught also Monday another class through Thursday at Woodside High School. That's what became Aikido West. I grew into that. So I went to class minimum for five times a week and usually usually eight to ten. If I can make it to San Francisco. <laughs> so yeah, you could say I was I was a fanatic, a young fiend. And so you're you're starting to study kind of Eastern mind body disciplines at this point. Um, but you're also still deep, deep in in golf. I mean you you you've you've done play golf at a very high level, right? Yeah. Well I was ranked in the top ten nationally as a junior golfer. And then when I went to Stanford, I hate to say how old I am, anyone can do the math, <laughs> but um, I was still young, you know, and it was just before what we have here in the States called Title IX, and that was a legal ruling that said girls as well as boys have to get equal financial support for, for, for athletics. So I was like right before Title IX, 
which meant that I went to Stanford as a top ranked junior golfer who would have been heavily recruited and gotten scholarships and all that stuff a few years later. But I went and there was hardly a women's golf team. There was no golf scholarship to be had. And so I kind of lost interest in golf in some ways. And I had these other interests. Um, I was going to Israel, as you know, and it was kind of in some early days and doing a lot of farming. That was the other thing. I, I was very physical in that regard. I love farming. I love driving tractors. I love getting my hands in the earth. I love, um, I I actually did the other side of golf. I worked for two years in golf course maintenance. So I was driving gang mowers and worked with a bulldozer and backhoe and front loader and shovels and uh, chainsaws. And I mean, everything and those little scooters, everything that goes along with outdoor landscape work. And and, uh, so that physical thing, I really loved. Uh, which is all to say, I really didn't play golf much from mm, probably age 20-ish to, you know, it was probably my, uh, 40, probably about 20 years, because I dove set so headlong into Aikido. Mm. And even, I got my black belt, oh God, 1979, I got my, my first degree black belt, uh, kind of stuck at fifth on for political reasons, but that's another story. Um, anyways, I uh, opened my own dojo when I was 25, and I mean, I just went... <laughs> from golf into, into Aikido. I mean, I played when I saw my parents, I played socially once in a while and I noticed it was very obvious that training in Aikido allowed me to maintain my golf game, shall we say, and even improve. And so it was just a natural thing to kind of relate, relate Aikido principles to, to something else, to a sport. And, and I should say too, you'll appreciate this. How did I really get into somatics and somatic psychology? Well, after college, I say I worked at a, at a golf course instead of playing on tour, which I had the ability to do. Here I was doing the other side of it, which is you know, actually very interesting at the end of the day. But some people said to me, you know, you should go to this place called the Lomi School. And I'm like, well, what's that? And the reason that came up was that after Aikido class, we very naturally started massaging each other, giving neck rubs and yeah. whatever, right? And in the course of doing that, people said, you know what, you've got great hands. Right? And my dad always liked, we always did neck, neck massages. And so, you know, I was a little bit familiar with that sort of thing. And at the Lomi School, which was run by, or put together really by Richard Strozzi Heckler and his wife at the time, who was into yoga and what they called conscious movement. And a guy named Dr. Robert Hall, who was um, an army psychiatrist. And he was working with Fritz Perls. And then Fritz was being Rolf by Ida Rolf. This is like back in the 60s, the so very early days. Of- yeah, we had Dan Hanlon Johnson on the show sort of talking about that scene when everyone's at Ezelan <laughs> and all these kind of big names are colliding. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Fritz sends Robert to get Rolf by Ida Rolf. I remember some stories of Robert and this other guy being in, in a room, uh, an apartment in San Francisco, and here's Ida Rolf digging in, and they've got the blinds closed, and she's telling them to not not scream, like don't make any noise while I just digging in because they don't want the cops to come. I mean, mm-hmm. all those great old stories. At any rate, they put all of that together. Uh, they also went to India. They had a meditation master, Chiran Singh, for some reason, I remember that name. They got into polarity therapy with Dr. Randolph Stone. This was all the early forerunner stuff in the like 60s, early 70s. And they put it all together. They were, spent some time in Hawaii and the islanders noticed them. And they started calling them Lomi Lomis, which was their kind of uh, healing, healing massage body work. And that's where they got the name for the Lomi School. Yeah, and it's different from Lomi Lomi Hawaiian Massage, right? It just shares yeah, that shares the name. It, it, that's, well, that's where the name came from, as I understand it. And Richard was doing Aikido, of course. So between Richard and his wife, who was doing this sort of conscious movement yoga, and Richard doing Aikido, they put those practices into this body of Lomi work. And then they were training people as body workers. And one of the things with that psychology background, uh, gestalt therapy, et cetera, was putting, kind of combining that with rolfing work. That, in my understanding, really came from this sense that, you know, when you start really digging into the body, you dig into the human being, you dig into the psyche, yeah. you dig into the emotions, they pop right up, that's what's there but that rolfers weren't really trained as, psycholo- as psychologists. So a lot of material would come up, and if you were a rolfer, you didn't necessarily know how to process that material. Well, and, and so they were trying to put practices in that were 
really holistic and that allowed a person to to understand to understand what was coming up through their body and then to have varying means to process it. So obviously that was really fascinating to me. And they were doing these trainings that were residential. I think I was in maybe one, the last one or one of the last ones. It was in Nevada, California. And we all lived in a house together, a group. There were people from Europe. They were from all over the place. And we, we lived in a house together six days a week. We had Sundays off, but it was morning till night. You started out with meditation. We did body work. We, we did uh, we had Gestalt therapy groups. We studied anatomy. We went to uh, UCSF in San Francisco. We dissected cadavers. I mean, this was serious stuff. We went to the dojo. We did this sort of yoga kind of work. Uh, we we were the group. We had a lot of issues come up. You can imagine living together in one house for thirteen weeks. So it was plenty 13, of process. Thirteen weeks. Oh yeah, it was. No, it was. It was. It was everything to think of California back then. Is, yeah. is what it was. Uh, so it was, it was all, it was pretty interesting. And we also, they put in Reiki and breath work. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And this was really like kind of back in the days, the heydays of things. And meanwhile, I was already uh, showed on. So most people didn't have background in Aikido with my background in Aikido. That helped so a showdown's a black belt for those who are listening. and yeah. don't know that. Time. Yeah. So that's really how I got involved. And when I got out of, when I, when I sort of graduated from the Lobby School and I opened my own bodywork practice, and you should imagine I'm like 25, I think. Um, I was in over my head, shall we say. I was a good physical body worker, but whoa, I had the same issue. It's like, what do I do with all this stuff? Um, yeah. people, are, people are feeling things. People are getting in touch with stuff about themselves, and I don't know what to do with it. So that's when I went back to school and I did my master's degree in clinical psychology and that's when I opened my dojo. And so there was a fabulous long period where I was starting, I apologize, I have a meeting that pops up all the time. Um, uh, anyway, so I opened my dojo and was able to work that way and I was studying and uh, ultimately graduated, did all of the you know, it's like 3,000 clinical hours, the whole deal you have to do in California to get your marriage family therapy license. I had my uh, body work, uh, sort of body psychotherapy practice. So you have to realize that, it, and I felt like for about 10 years that I was a novice, you know, being young and being new at things, but also being young, because I think it takes a lot of life experience. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because when I started doing embodied work in business, I was 27, 28. Uh-huh. And I'm finding now I'm, you know, got a beard and put on some weight and, uh, you know, I'm a bit grayer. It's, it's become much easier. And <laughs> yeah. um, both, both how people taking me more seriously, but also uh, just life experience. You know, there's a few years there. There's some love and some loss. And, uh, you know, and without being ageist, it's pretty tricky to be doing deep transformational embodied work at 25 or even running a dojo at 25. That's young to be an Aikido sensei, right? Yeah, it all was young. I, I remember when I used to want to be older. <laughs> Darn, <laughs> if I would have only known. But yeah, I mean, it, I wanted some gravitas. I wanted some more experience. I didn't want to look and feel so young. It was more, though, really about, it wasn't the age so much as just life experience. And yeah. that seems to come with years. And yeah. experience of doing the work as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And so, I mean, your Aikido, as or an Aikido teacher, you have some sort of very classical Aikido training from one of the, the students of someone who trained with the founder of Aikido, but you've also taken Aikido into some really interesting directions, haven't you? Combining it with body work, doing peace work. I mean, whatever you want to talk about, Jamie's cool. There's so many interesting things you've done. So just what's, what's like fresh on top today? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, we could talk about a variety of things, I guess. We could maybe the women's to work the... always one by one. I'll tell you what, uh, as it turns out, I formed a company about 20 years ago. It's a, mm. it's a corporation in America, right? Inc. And it's called the Kiai way Inc. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? I, I didn't realize it till after I named it, that it was basically saying Aikido, the Kiai way. And mm-hmm. you can take those, kanji those characters key and i life energy and i is the the it means love right love unity harmony oneness everything working together synchronized uh, so this life energy that's all working together in, in a in a synchronized harmonious way um so you can say i key or ki i and do of course is the way i also like do in english because it looks like do 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, pragmatic. <laughs> yes, I think you'll appreciate that because we know that all of this is a practice. I mean, you've got to do this stuff, right? Um, well, let me just say a little something before I go into any specific areas, but it's sort of an underpinning is Aikido, the Kiai way, is really, for me, sort of informs everything I do. And because I think it's ultimately sort of generic. Gen- Aikido is a generic practice. It's got universal uh, ways that it, it allows us to understand life energy, key in a body on the planet, <laughs> how it works through us, how, and it's, it's working all the time. I mean, whether we know it or not, whether we're conscious or not, it's happening. We're subjects to its, its laws, its movement, its interactions. And so Aikido, for me, is a way to, to understand that, to experience it, and then ultimately to apply it. And since it's universal, it's generic, it's applicable in absolutely everything we do. So yes, so, it can be applied to martial arts kind of classically, but also you have applied it to golf, to business, to peace building, to all these different areas. And just well, sometimes on the podcast, we, no, go ahead. Uh, sometimes on the podcast, we give people little experiences that are listening. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just the abstract kind of talking, you know, if someone's riding the subway in New York or walking down the street in London, uh, how would you bring this idea of Aiki rather than just martial arts to life? Okay, well, I'll give a practice in a minute that mm. anyone can do uh, anywhere, anytime, <laughs> which they ought to be able to do. Um, I, I'll say this. I realized a long time ago, it was wonderful to have my dojo. I miss not having it. had it for about 15 years. Incredible laboratory for so many things. But I realized that, you know, this many people on the planet are, yeah. are going to go to a dojo. They're going to bother to put on a martial arts uniform and spend all this time and sweat and have people attack them and strike them and hit them and kick them and choke them. <laughs> Who wants to do it, right? Um, yeah. a, a small percentage of the population. However, these principles are so important and they're so powerful that for me, it's become important to, to make them, uh, to bring them to the world, to bring them to bigger numbers of people and to make them accessible. So I'll make them accessible, but I'll first start talking about golf to do that. Because golf is so, it's so visual. I mean, so obvious, uh, a sport, any sport. So in golf, for example, what do you have? You have people, the classical thing is golf is people are killing it, right? They, they look at this ball, they're standing still. It's easier when you're hitting a tennis ball or some movement, more, a sport that has more movement. But here a golfer is standing there. And we always have a job to do, no matter what it is in business or right now we're having a job, right? Um, So the job in golf is to hit the ball, move it to where you want it to go. And we usually have a target and a goal and we're getting results. We're getting a score. We're making the money. We're getting the job or or the deal, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. Um, having the relationship work. So, okay. So that's the job in golf, really obvious. And so what people do is they stand there and if you're a golfer, (laughs) You're sitting there inside your internal talk is like, ah, how am I going to do this? You don't even know what to do. Uh, okay. So what people do is they just kind of tense up for a moment and then they go like this and they go whack as hard as they can, uh, which we call killing the ball. Mm-hmm. And then when that doesn't work, what they do is more of the same. They just go off and hit it harder, try to kill it some more. So you can imagine that I'll sort of gestalt therapy this, like I'll ask a CEO, for example, in business to uh, be my golf ball. So I got this person, usually a guy, not always, but uh, standing there. And uh, so this person's my golf ball and I hit it and then I hit it harder because it didn't work, right? Uh, Very well. The results aren't that great. Then we can kind of ask, well, how'd that feel? It's like, well, don't hit me anymore. So what does the ball do? It goes and it gets lost or it goes out of bounds or it goes in the bottom of the lake. It's like, ah, don't hit me again. So the question would be, what makes the golf ball go? Okay. What really, I'm standing here. What really makes my golf ball go? And a lot of people say, well, because I hit it, uh, my mind, my thoughts, uh, there's momentum, there's the club, the club had it on the ball, momentum, the swing, well, all these things. But really, my, my brilliant Stanford if I read a cap, the answer is what makes the golf ball go? You, me, right? That's what's really making the golf ball go is you or me. And so then the question is, what is me? And it's not really a, an existential question. It's, it's a practical question from the somatic body point of view. So what, if, what am I? I am life energy in a body. Distinguishing characteristic of life on the planet. 
we get born, we got this body, we have this energy that breathes and moves through us. And it allows us to think, it allows us to have emotions and feel, it allows us to physically move. We have a, a spirit, a drive, a passion, a motivation. So mind, body, emotion, spirit, energy in a body. And he or she who can sort of master how this life energy works is going to do better. So these principles, um, I've sort of synthesized all this stuff into what I call a mind, body, self-mastery technology. And it starts with getting centered. All right. So when I get centered into my, my lower belly and my core, and then that connects me naturally to my ground and base. Just because your center's in your belly, that's in your hips, that's over your legs and, and feet. So a natural connection between the, the center and the base. So now I've already got some stability. I've got an organized structure. And actually, num number three, it's seven steps. Number three is to relax. Relax and breathe. When we're tense, all our energy gets stuck in us. It's not going to go into the golf club or the swing or the golf ball, ultimately. <sighs> relax and breathe. Number four is unify and align. Unify is bringing together the left and right sides of our, of our body, of our brain, our lower and upper body, what I call our inner and outer body, our thought with our execution. So that's unify in a line. We've got to have proper alignments. So skewed up is screwed up. That's one of my, my things I like to say when we're not in alignment. Skewed up is screwed up. That's unify in a line. Number five is unique to Aikido, which is blend. And blend is to go with instead of resist. Number six is let go. I'm not really in control. Let go to this bigger, um, bigger intelligence, this bigger energy that's moving through us, that's got more capability than my, my just separated ego self. And then number seven is flow, so that we're in a state of flow. So anyways, here I am. I'm standing by golf ball, right? About to hit this golf ball. Instead of up here in the upper body and tension and force, it's like, and duality, me hitting this ball, it's like, whoa, center, align, you know, align, unify, get grounded, and a flow, we get connected here, and the lower body's moving, and all of a sudden, the, this, this big man moves, <laughs> the golf ball flies. And that's the nice thing about both martial arts and golf, which I think appeals to business, isn't it, is that there's a result that's tangible, even the, the big guy that you're, you know, working with flies across the room, I've seen you f f throw big Arab guys around, and they're like, how is this little Jewish woman doing this, and it speaks... Don't forget the Russians! <laughs> And the big Russians, we'll get to the big Russians. And that, and that speaks more than like some fancy words about peace and energy, you know, is the fact that you can throw these guys. Um, or uh, the, the ball is, 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 you know, going further and more accurately. You know, we talked to Paul Linden the other day, and he's very big on sort of proving things and the, and the, the proofs in the pudding. And I, I think that translates mm -hmm. really well into business. So I'd love to hear a bit about your business work as well. So you're, you're actually the first embodiment person we've had on the show, who, aside from myself, who works primarily in business. So um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about that side of things as well. Okay, well, we're going to get to business in a minute. Well, just a little bit more on golf. And I, want to give a, I want to give a practice, and then we'll go to business, mm -hmm. uh, how that applies. Um, well, this, this matter of, get, of following that technology, right, which is very doable, uh, and I work on that. I teach that to executives. I call it effortless power for unprecedented success, and it's how you're going to organize your organization, and it's also how you're going to organize yourself as a leader and as a speaker, as speaking to your board or your stockholders or your employees or your colleagues, anybody. It's, it's how we need to be, right? It doesn't matter what we're doing. We're singing a song, running a company, running a meeting, hitting a golf ball, hitting a tennis ball. It really doesn't matter. Um, but so, um, you know, here we are in golf, and what happens is the ball flies, and we're in more of a unity, a unity with ourselves, with what we call the life energy of the universe, what Deep, Dr. Deepak Chopra calls this intelligent energy soup that's everywhere that we can we can really consciously connect ourselves to then we realize that's what's moving through the body so that's what's making the golf ball go it's interesting in aikido here we've got bodies 100 150 200 250 pounds 300 pounds you know big people that we need to throw and then in golf you've got this little teeny white ball and people laugh a lot about chasing this stupid little white ball around but let me tell you, when you got this big person with, I don't, I forget how many thoughts we get in, we have in a minute, how many emotions we have going on. We've got all these body parts. We've got all these systems inside the body going on, all that at once. And we've got to somehow from standing perfectly still from a dress to the top of the backswing, hitting the ball, that takes about one second. 
on, on a clock. One second, going, the club is going zero miles an hour. You make a turn and wind up and get back to the ball in one second. That club head's going 80, 90, over 100 miles an hour of speed. That's faster than cars on a freeway. That's how much energy we have in our body. And when we use it properly, instead of just doing this, if we use it properly, the momentum we generate from this energy inside our body. And in golf, you've got to focus it to this little tiny white ball. So you got two different challenges in Aikido or golf. The, the incredible focus in one second, and, and the club has to be square in just this split split second when it's coming through the ball at 100 miles an hour. Or, uh, and in, in Aikido, we've got these like big, thick people <laughs> with all that stuff going on that we've got to somehow move or maybe throw. I mean, that's, those, are, those are challenges. Um, but that's why engaging in these things, if you start to engage in any practice at that level, it becomes so freaking fascinating. And, yeah, and these ways, the, the richness is there, isn't it? It draws it oh because it's hard. Because yeah. it's hard to throw someone without effort or be, to focus well, on a little golf ball or whatever it is it. It draws you in, and people like us are a bit obsessive and maybe are cognitively intelligent, but it's like, oh, we, we, we really want to get into that. <laughs> well, well, that's what's so fun for me. I think that's where my, my athlete, my farmer, has come in uh, from my sort of brain is going, uh, I don't think I could be a professor. Uh, but I would need the physical part more. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I couldn't just uh, sort of only be a jock. I, I kind of needed them both. And then you've got sort of the spiritual dimension. So that's what's so beautiful about these things. And, um, but I think the somatic dimension for me is really about saying life on the planet is a physical experience. Again, it's a distinguishing characteristic. It's about having a body in a physical material universe uh, or, or setting on the planet uh, and yet what's really going on is this, this consciousness, this, this cognition, this spirituality, this emotionality, this sort of intangibles are happening in the tangible. And we have to do things tangibly. I mean, even if you're a professor, even if you're a monk, you're doing physical things all the time. Meditation is a physical thing. Studying, writing, speaking, teaching, those are still physical matters. It, uh, you know, you don't have to be be a, a, an athlete or something. And it's certainly an artist is doing very physical things when they're painting or singing or whatever it might be. So everybody is engaged at a physical level, a somatic level. That's just what life is. And then the question is, how do we sort of become aware that what's really going on is this energy inside of us that's got a consciousness that's connected in the body that directs the body to do what we do and get results that we want, whether a result we're looking for is inner peace or um, raising a kid well or running a business that, that achieves its goals or hitting a golf ball or singing a song, hitting a note. I mean, uh, we're all doing something physical and we're all trying to get something to happen, right? We're all, we're all looking for results. Mm, so, the, so the results focus here is, is interesting to me. Um, did you want to lead a practice? Did you say you had something? Yeah, yeah. Thinking of? Yeah. Well, um, okay. You know, we talk about centering a lot. And for me, the first thing around centering is just to stand in good posture and, or sit in good posture. We can do that. Um, and and what do you mean by good? Kind of aligning? Good. So good posture. Let's talk about good because it's not a moral issue. <laughs> we, were, we were raised like that, right? Sit up straight. <laughs> um, so not a moral issue. It's such a practical matter. And the reason is that we have something called gravity. Yeah. Um, and gravity, I usually, speaking of business, I'll ask, I don't have any here with me, but uh, I'll ask a CEO if uh, I can, if this is his, his or her cell phone. So they'll give me their cell phone and I'll go, is this important to you? We'll, we'll imagine this is a cell phone. Okay. Um, so is this important to you? It's like, yeah, it's my life. Ah. <laughs> I go, well, um, okay. Do you mind if I drop it? <laughs> so, you know, we'll go like this and we'll drop it. And then we I kind of move my hand a little lower, drop it some more. I mean, you only have to go from a couple inches to here, or meters, whatever, millimeters. And, you know, by, by three, four, five inches, this is already dangerous. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want to drop it. And why is that? It's what we call gravity. So gravity is this force that's, that's here all the time. And it's so powerful that within a very short space, it would already cause damage. Yeah? Yeah. So... So when we are in good posture, that's why the chiropractors are interested in subluxations and, and stuff. You want to be in good posture so that you can align yourself, make what I call a blend with gravity. 
And when we have that posture and our bones and everything are in alignment with gravity and we're not forward and back and all off, off balance and stuff, as the balance is coming in here. When we're in gravity, all of a sudden we can relax because our muscles, our tissues are falling properly over our skeletal structure and boy, life feels a lot better. That's the way we want to be. So the first thing around centering is to find that sort of heaven and earth axis is what we call it in Aikido. Tenshinage, uh, heaven and earth, it's in everything. It's in, it's in the Bible, right? Shamayim va'aretz, that's the Hebrew for it. So we get in this sort of blend, this unity, this aiki with the gravity. Already things are easier and better, and we can relax and breathe. Uh, then the next thing would be to imagine that somebody just came and dropped a bowling ball straight down the chute, <laughs> straight down the chute of your torso, and it lands in your belly. And so you want to kind of let it land in your belly. So all of a sudden you feel this heaviness in your lower abdomen and that kind of automatically if you're sitting like i'm sitting right now i feel i feel the weight of my of my butt and my thighs and all of a sudden it's like coming down to my feet i even feel my shoulders relaxing if i was standing or if somebody's standing and doing this they'll feel <laughs> their knees will naturally kind of bend uh, or relax and usually people report feeling the the soles of their feet they feel more in balance. They feel more present. They feel stronger, which is amazing. I mean, I always kid the CEOs. You didn't have to eat spinach, and you didn't have to go to the gym, and you didn't have to. Uh, didn't take any time. It took about what a, a second, a fraction of a moment. It with mind, body, consciousness in the body. Just imagining, thinking. There's a bowling ball comes straight down my middle. Middle would be the center. Boom, lands in my lower belly. The lower belly in in Aikido and med Japanese meditation practices is called the Hara. In Chinese, we know it's called the Tantian. So this is a physical center of gravity in the body. I always think about the Buddha with a big, a big belly. I don't think that was an accident. <laughs> There's this enlightened uh, being with a big belly because boom, that's where we, that's where we get this sort of uh, connection to our physical center of gravity in our, our in the body. So that's one thing. Just feel that. Another thing I like to do is to get kind of shook up. So I ask people to get shook up. Maybe they're emotionally reactive. Maybe they're worried. Maybe they're stressed. Maybe they're busy. They're kind of disconnected from the body, right? Because they're out here. And so we'll get shook up and imagine one of those snow globes that you shake up and all the snow is this. So the snow is like your your molecules of energy, shall we say. <laughs> the molecules of your mind and your emotions and it's all shook up. And then the snow settles. So you just sort of set, and when does it settle? When you put it down, you set it on something. That's when we, boom, we set ourselves on the earth. We get in our lower belly, we feel our legs and feet. And then it's just a feeling of, of seeing, visualizing, feeling, imagining, whatever your strong suits are, uh, and, and imagining the snow settling. And that's what we call in Aikido, this weight underside feeling, this and all of a sudden, things get quiet. When I do this with a group in a room, it's amazing how quiet. You can hear the quiet. Yeah. And so the chatter in our mind stops. It, it, everything gets kind of quiet. It gets grounded. It gets settled. So that would be another one. And then another one that just really put it all together. So here we are. We're present in our lower belly and our legs and feet. We've settled. We're already exhaling. We're breathing. We're relaxing. Things are getting quiet. We're noticing the effects and all of our, our main faculties. And then the next one would be, try this, Mark, you like this. Clap your hands, just clap your hands, okay? So when we clap our hands, that's good. So right here, it's like a sword, yeah? But do this, so we've got our sword, and then we're gonna move our hands off center. Okay, so for those of you to listen on the podcast, there's clapping hands right in front, in the middle, and then moving it slightly yeah. to the side. Yeah, if I was standing up, I'll stand for a minute. I'm standing, here's my center, okay? And clap my hands. And then that's, uh, then I'll just move my hands off center. See mm -hmm. Go back to center. Is that any different? Move off center. So it's, for me, it's always a trial and error practice. We want to contrast. So this is when I'm off center. This is when I'm on center. Feel the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Even a little off center. It's not the same. Center, very clear. So I have people who've never held a sword, never done a centering or martial arts practice, and their hands just go, boom. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, it's very, very natural, natural, isn't it? If you're having a cup of tea, you do it in the middle. 
And, and, and if we're really paying attention to that, we can refine that, you know, whether it's with the golf or the throwing people. And after a while, that sense can really be, be quite, you know, even a little bit off can seem like a lot off with some practice. Well, you know, what we do is in somatic practice um, would be, so here I am, we got all these people and we, what's different? Oh, well, I seem, I feel like I stopped breathing. I kind of inhaled and got stuck. Yeah. I feel like I'm sort of, awesome. I'm feeling strain here. I don't feel as organized in my, <laughs> my neurology doesn't feel the same. I go here, I'm like, ah, oh, it's like home. I exhale, I go down, I'm, I'm relaxed. And then when we start applying that, it's like, let's say you're um, meeting someone and you shake hands, right? You want to do that from your center. So you don't just go like this. Over yeah. here. Uh, if I'm golfing, how many golfers stand here like this? Yeah. So it's again, if so I this. Oh, this would be, this is part of how we're going to organize ourselves golfing. Um, no matter what it is, uh, you know, you're playing a guitar, you're not, you know, you're like, I got this sense here. Even something like a violin is over here, but I'm sure people aren't feeling off center. They still feel very centered, even though you can be centered, even though you're doing something off to the side, right? Um, yeah. And golf, we go to backswing and a forward swing, but I'm centered over here, I'm centered here, I'm centered here, I'm centered here. So it's about this inner, inner um connection <clears throat> and having that organized and it turns out that it's like the brain hemispheres seem to connect then but this is very clear and it, it has stunned me how i can say batting a thousand <laughs> with a lot of people from refugee camps to high levels of government and business everyone just goes boom <laughs> with you know, zero you know on the one hand, you know, people like yourself had a lot of training in this, thousands and thousands of hours across different disciplines. But on the other hand, you know, just putting your head above your hips, that's fairly something most people can work out, relaxing yeah. a little bit more. You know, people might need to help, help with that, but it can, can, you know, people know when they're really tense and, uh, you know, there might be a low level of tension they can't work, work through, but at least to be able to relax a little and to do something in front of them. Um, to be able to, whether it's with on their computer or talking to someone, to be able to actually have to, to align to that kind of central position. These are, these are, on one hand, fairly simple, straightforward things. On, on the other hand, people forget to do them. Well, yeah, exactly. And to go to the business world, some of the training I do, um, I really kind of <clears throat> I don't know, specialize in this whole area of stress and how that affects us uh, and then how we can shift uh, sort of the, we have a bumper sticker. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, pardon the, the swear word, but it's like shit happens. Yeah. So shit mm -hmm. and stress happen, but shit happens. Shift needs to happen. That's the bumper sticker. And the idea is, um, when we're stressed and in martial arts, we purposely put ourselves under stress. We get attacked, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> golf, you're stressed. <laughs> you got to hit this ball and people are looking or you got money on it or you got to get a score. Or how do I hit the ball? Right. We're stressed. Um, and business, obviously we have every conversation, every job we're doing, every, everything's like stress. Um, <clears throat> but stress can, stress has its good aspects. It's very motivating. It gives us extra energy and focus up to a point. There's sort of a hump you go down and you start to get into the declining, uh, returns of stress. And it's in that, that, um, you know, we want to look at because it affects our thought process, our decision making, it affects our emotional intelligence, it affects our physical well being, affects how we show up, our palms sweaty and our heart's beating, and my voice is funny, and you know, all these things. I'm so nervous, can't, can't really perform or operate well. So it's like, oh, it turns out that when we center, when we ground, when we breathe, when we relax, when we align, you were mentioning, you know, your head's just over your belly, like, sort of like, duh. But when you get really aware of it, and then you're aware, oh, that it's, it's not only over my belly, it's over my throat. <clears throat> That's what we call the, the throat chakra, right? The communication center. Then we have our heart center where we feel and we have empathy and we have compassion. Then we go down to our belly and that's where we have power and down into our legs. <clears throat> um, and I mean, I'll have CEOs just, act, you know, we get into it and really feeling that alignment and noticing that they can connect their thought process with their with their heart, with their values, with, um, with their power, and then with what they communicate. I'm lucky I'm from California because whenever this gets a little too out there for people, I just laugh. I go, you know, I can talk about this. We're from California. But I've noticed it's here in Iowa. <laughs> it's here in Palestine. It's here in well, you know, it's everywhere I go. It's in Russia. And how do you make these ideas accessible? I've got my own answer to this, obviously. <laughs> but how do you make these ideas accessible to sort of the, the business person in Iowa or the uh, – a Palestinian you're working with in the Middle East or, you know, are people that aren't from California and didn't go to Stanford? Like what's, what's the, uh, how do you, what's the route in? 
Well, it's really asking that question, like, what makes my golf ball go? I mean, people can yeah. really, whether they golf or not, or it could be what makes your tennis ball go or your, your soccer ball, it really doesn't matter. So you ask that question, what makes it go? And you sort of back it up. I back it up to me, you, <laughs> I make it go. And then who am I? Okay. I'm this life energy in a body. Uh, what does that mean? And that, that's universal. It also transcends race, religion, nationality, gender, age, uh, orientations of any sort, right? So it's really universal. This is our common humanity. This is really the explanation of how um, I, in a smaller body, can throw somebody in a bigger body, right? Because at this level, or how we affect each other, how a little eensy teeny dog <laughs> can have so much effect, or a little tiny baby. It's not about size. It's about this common thing inside of us all. When we start to operate at that level, and we start doing that by becoming aware of it in ourselves and, and feeling it and working with it, then all of a sudden, uh, I call it magic, you know, the mechanics for the magic. It's like magic seems to happen. All this stuff starts happening at that, that, that level. Um, and, you know, one way I make it accessible is to just that question, you know, what makes anything work or go? Um, and then uh, if anybody uses these things, you know, just, just cite me, that's all. But um, I, I developed a really great exercise that I love to do kind of early on in, in my trainings. And I'll ask for two volunteers. So imagine CEOs of a company, right? And uh, so they come up. I've already given them a, a rap about the body, how the body's so important, uh, which I could give you that rap too. But uh, so, and then I, I tell them, you get to lay down. And they're like, oh, great. I'm so stressed. I'm so tired. Cool. So they lay down. They lay down side by side. Uh, and you know, no snuggling, no, no making out, all that stuff. Okay, that's cool. Um, and then we go, okay, uh, one of you, uh, and we're looking just at the body today uh, in this moment, we're not looking at their names and their positions. We're just looking at these two bodies are laying here. And one is, I ask one person to be asleep, okay? And then I ask the other person if they mind playing dead. So we've all played dead, right? <laughs> you go, what do you do to play dead? You go, you like to yeah, breathe. You don't up. Move. Yeah, stiffen up, don't move, don't breathe. Anyway, so we've got two bodies laying here. One's asleep, one's dead. And we walk in the room. And we kind of feel like something's funny. We just sort of get the vibe, right? We know something's, we don't know what it is. And then all of a sudden we go, oh my God, one person's dead. <laughs> How would you know that, what's the difference between one sleeping body and one dead body? Yeah. And the answer basically is one's breathing, the other isn't. Okay. So now, uh, now we are already have kind of opened up the entire subject of breathing. I could get into yoga breathing. I could get into anything I want about, about breathing. We realize that life is one big breath. It's like first thing with a little newborn baby is get an inhale and we wait for the last breath. So we have one big breath. Lucky we are, we get more breaths in between. But managing our breath, breath really does carry this life force. It's the difference between life and, and death, right? A, a live body and a dead body. So now I can talk about breath all I want and all kinds of breathing practices. And then the next question is, besides that one's breathing and the other isn't, there's something else. This person who's asleep is going to get up and walk and talk and make love, make money, do all kinds of things. And this one isn't. Why not, besides that they're not breathing and they're dead? So ultimately, the answer gets around to, hmm, this thing that we don't have a word for in the West that they do in the East, they call it ki or chi or kundalini or um, prana, right? <laughs> this life energy, that's our best, our best translation, our best word we have for it. This thing, this life energy, this thing that animates the body is present in one and isn't present. And I usually ask if people have been there when someone has passed. And it's a really profound experience. And most people have a sense that something, we don't know what to call it, soul, spirit, but something has left or something isn't present anymore. Uh, and so it's this presence of this sort of intangible thing that's super tangible. It's real. It makes all the difference between life and death. So now we can start talking about life energy. Okay. Mm, that just kind of that, that one exercise. I mean, there's other things I do, but that one exercise opens up everything, and it's very clear. And it's all it's fun, you know. 
plain dead and all. And of course, as a CEO, so you want to talk about the business environment. I mean, right away, I, I always kid these guys because they're laying there with their eyes closed, right? Because they're dead and they're asleep and everybody else has got their cell phones out. They're getting ready for Facebook and, <laughs> and everything else. I mean, I tease them. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's a fun exercise, but it's, it's pretty impactful. And it's not one that you're going to forget soon. But what I love about it is how it opens the door to talk about life energy and also about things like even gratitude. Like yeah. no matter what's happening, let's be pretty grateful that our energy is still in our body because when it isn't, like that's it. It's not here anymore. And also we ought to be pretty good stewards of our life energy, uh, ma- or what we would call in the martial arts, a black belt, a master of your life energy. He or she who can be more masterful in how they use this life energy that we have the blessing to have in our body for the time being uh, is going to sort of do better, um, live better, maybe be healthier, maybe accomplish what they want more, uh, maybe just enjoy more, uh, think better, feel better, relate better, et cetera. Well, the, the time's flying away, and I'd love to hear something uh, to hear you speak about your work uh, in Russia when you were going over in the kind of communist days. And mm. also, least you talked about the body being a universal, something that connects people. And I know you've mm-hmm. done work uh, with women's martial arts, with gay community, your brother's a politician, it's fairly well known. You've been involved with politics, citizen diplomacy. Let's open up that area. <laughs> uh, it's juicy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I'm Jewish, as we know. And uh, back in the early 70s, it was the beginning of the uh, let my people go of Soviet Jewry. And I was at Stanford. I started to study Russian. Uh, studied hard and I had already begun learning Hebrew. I knew some French. And so I had this idea that I was going to help get the Soviet Jews out of Russia. That's why I needed to learn Russian <clears throat> and have those languages. Europe was the way station. And then things changed. I didn't really go that direction. In fact, I got involved in Aikido and Lomi school, everything else. So, but here we were in 1987 and I got a phone call from another, uh, one of my main Aikido senseis, Koichi Bear sensei. And he called and he said, we're going to Russia and you're coming. I'm like, huh? (laughs) And it was the early days of Glasnost, Gorbachev opening up Russia. And we had this, this opportunity to go as just about the first group of foreign martial artists because Martial arts had been outlawed under communism. So off we went to Russia with Bear Sensei, about 35 of us. And that was the beginning of citizens' diplomacy uh, days and a realization for me how powerful Aikido is in that regard. And it's so powerful because a couple of things. One is it's physical, right? <laughs> Here we are. We got Americans and Russians, the commies that we're afraid of, and who knows what they think of the Americans. And we've been enemies and Cold War. We can't, we can't have any contact. All of a sudden we can. And with Aikido, we can have physical contact because we touch, we grab, we roll, we fall down, we sweat. You know, we, we know each other. We, we interact at a physical level. So Aikido is a vehicle right away that put us into physical contact and experiential contact, I should say, where we get to, to really know each other at that level. So that was really cool. And then Aikido has this philosophy of peace. It's like there is no enemy out there. The only enemy is the mind of discord within. Great sayings from the, from the founder, O Sensei, um, and it, that we're to we're all one human family, and the loving protection of all life. It's like wow, when these people have been our enemies. And what happened was within, I mean, really minutes, hours of getting off the airplane, getting through the gulag. I mean, at that time, eighty seven. I mean, it was all army, and it felt it was really awesome. Yeah, that was, that's kind of Rocky Four territory, right? You know, this yeah. is really, <laughs> the Afghan wars going on with the Russians. You know. Yeah. The different Olympics have just been boycotted in LA and Moscow. <laughs> Here is Cold War territory. Oh, oh, yeah. And, you know, we went through all that just getting through the airport. I mean, they confiscated our cameras and all sorts of stuff. And, I mean, we had to stay in the state hotels and change our money and show our receipts at the end when we left and all kinds of stuff. Um, our movements were very restricted at the time. For all of that, once we got together on the mat with Russians and started to grab hands and roll around and do this stuff, and considering explicitly articulating this philosophy of peace, we're really all one. What's inside you is inside of me and let's blend and harmonize. And that's even more powerful. And with love, I mean, it's, it's transformative. We transform a conflict. We transform relationships, utterly transformative. And it started happening in minutes, just so naturally. It was so powerful, so wonderful, so life-changing. And we had friends who were Russians. The Russians had American friends. We weren't enemies 
any more within a day, you know? <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is, this is awesome. This is doing what it's meant to do, what it theoretically would do when we had the physical experience of traveling there and getting together and on the mat. Yeah, well, there's a way in which it transcends just talking, isn't it? You know, people uh, tend to get conceptual and argue with discussions, but it, it's, it's a physicality, but not just a physicality of sports. There's a particular reciprocal setup to Aikido. The, the techniques work better when you're relaxed and expansive, so it's <laughs> encouraging you to kind of to a certain embodiment. And yeah. uh, you know, I experienced that with you uh, in Cyprus as well, you know, in, in part of the Middle East peace process that we've been involved in. Yeah, exactly. And think about it. It starts with a bow. We're absolutely equal. It's, that's been so profound for a Palestinian and an Israeli. Bow in as equals, uh, you know, with respect, with that sense of namaste. Yeah. Like the, the God in me bows, the God in you, that sort of thing. It doesn't matter, man, woman, age, uh, old, young. I mean, all these things, we start very equally and we work respectfully. We Aikido is structured so it's equal. Four times I attack, four times you attack. Right side, left side, right side, left side. We come out with this very balanced uh, experience just because of the structure, which is really cool. And it's kind of like bringing this Buddhist, shall we say, influence into a Russian American situation or a Middle East situation or an African situation. It's like it's something outside of all those uh, cultural conflicts. And that's just such a nice influence. And if you take it as that sort of centering, calming Buddha energy in these situations that's pretty cool <laughs> and you've say. been accepted amongst kind of arab communities like you know big arab guys doing aikido and there you come as this american jewish woman can i add the next bit yeah lesbian like <laughs> it's, it's like it's like you know what else what else it's kind of looks like a bad setup you know this isn't gonna go well but uh, that's not the case at all don't forget the corporate environment. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, we'll add that in. So, um, California, you know, all the, you know, all the boxes that might be thought of as perhaps difficult in, say, working in that environment. And, uh, you know, you're very accepted and loved. I, I know there and uh, able to, as I say, put it on the mat to demonstrate mm -hmm. it in, in the reality. And, and um, you know, it must be pretty special for you working in Israel and Palestine and those kind of areas as well. Oh, I mean, there's nothing I love more than doing all of this. And, and it never ceases to amaze me. You know this, Mark, when you're doing Aikido technique and you're like, oh my God, it works. What did I do? You know, like, I didn't do that much and it works. It's the same feeling. It's like, oh my God, this works in all these places. This works. Uh, I actually had, this was interesting. I was on the porch in the West Bank with a Palestinian who had just gotten out of jail. I don't know what, why he was there and you know what he'd done and, and all. He was pretty newly out of jail and we're talking, right? And we have, and it's like time actually stopped. This was my most time stopped moment of my life was talking with him. Uh, <clears throat> and we were into all of this and we did a little bit of Aikido stuff. And I'd done an Aikido training for, for some Palestinian, um, you know, national active nationalist activists. And this man just stops in time and he looks at me and he says, Jamie, you are messenger. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you are Let a messenger. Me. And I was like, hmm, well, thank you. Um, but honestly, I mean, I just feel like, you know, going back to when I was sort of born knowing this stuff, and I've just been fortunate to um, have a, enough energy <laughs> to spend my life uh, studying it, learning it, teaching it, practicing it, whatever, um, adapting it uh, to go, hmm, that, like I said, it's sort of a calling. It's like, um, okay, somehow I've got these these definitions of myself, right? Woman or Jewish or gay or California, all American, you know, all those labels that we all have. And I go, wow, this works with all these different people. It really is universal. It really is generic. And, you know, you start doing Aikido, you go, everybody's hand and arm and uh, back and shoulders and hips and belly and feet, they're all the same, you know? I mean, we we have the same body and we're doing this body practice that O-sensei, the founder, gave us. And you go, this is a real universal language. This is why sport has become quite a vehicle for peace mm. because we, again, we interact and uh, kicking a soccer ball or whatever it is, every country has a team <laughs> that plays the sport and it's a universal language and has kind of rules that are universal for the most part that we all are to abide by so that we can interact in a 
in a civilized, humane way. Uh, some uh, what I like about Aikido is that it does. It's not necessarily I win you lose. It's not. Yeah, competitive. it's not competitive, right? There's a difference between that and football or basketball. Yeah. Or like you know, I'm okay. You're not. The whole point of Aikido is. Uh, and as a martial art, it's not like I'm okay. It doesn't matter what happened to you. Um, I'm okay. You're okay. It's this harmlessness thing. It's this win-win thing. It's this, how can we transform this to this where we're both prospering in creative ways that we don't even know where that flow is going to. Yeah. And yeah. There is something a bit different about it as embodied practice, you know, in terms of this win-win in terms of the body mind states, it creates the emphasis on reciprocity and gentleness and looking after one's partner and transforming aggression I mean, I I think theatre, I think, comes close as a kind of bicommunal practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Lengio's bicommunal being the word of sort of two communities that may have been in conflict. Um, but an orchestra. Yeah. I've seen orchestras and circuses that bring... Yeah, there are some other yeah. things that are certainly Beautiful good. Things. Like uh, having explored yeah. quite a lot of them, I think Aikido, you know, unfortunately, as you say, it's just so m- a minority in the number of people that are actually going to be on the mat. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of creating bonds between people that can uh, take it out into other ways, you know, like extensions kind of idea, whether yeah. that's corporate or peace communities, you know, teaching centering to kids. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had some, some special experiences myself. You know, I remember mm-hmm. with the late Don Levine, going mm-hmm. into a dojo in Ramallah and right. uh, going, you know, oh my God, am I going to walk out of here? These guys with sort of <laughs> beards and stairy eyes as we walked in and posters for sort of Hamas or whatever it was around all, around all the building. And I'm thinking, God, this, is this going to go well? And, you know, it went beautifully and it, mm-hmm. you know, was, was working with youth there. and was wonderful. So yeah, they they can be very touching experiences, those kind of things. Yeah. Well, imagine like, say 1989 and I'm leading trips, right? I'm like the head sensei, not the man, right? And I'm this American woman, whatever. And I'm like, I got all these Russians and not all, but a lot, mostly men. And these are big guys and they're challenging and they're like, who are you? Come on. Um, And uh, the respect was there it, it, just from, you know, they grab me. It's like, boom, like, whoa, something's here. <laughs> and it's a surprise. Aikido is yeah. always a surprise. And you go, wow, there's really something here. And whoa, this works. This works in a whole different way. This is something else. But what, what I like to bring to people is that in a way it's like, whoa, this is something else. It's only something else because we're not trained in it. And I think yeah. that's what I think that's what we're trying to do. I know that's what you're trying to do, and all of our colleagues in this field are trying to do is to go. You know what? This is everywhere. <laughs> this is what's in me. We just don't have an education in it, and it doesn't. It, so this is what somatic education is. Once we tap into that, it's like uh, it's like magic. You know, <laughs> I mean, it seems like magic only because we operate in such a three D separated muscle power. Sure, it's like a language people haven't learned yet, yeah, right? Like, like. <laughs> If like if you speak to me in Hebrew, it sounds like a complete mess. If you spoke to me in Russian, I'm kind of learning Russian right now, so I start to learn. Just mm. the, it's it's been like this magic of all of a sudden, like understand <laughs> things my wife is saying, you know? <laughs> yeah, what do you know? It's like, wow, but it's just because I've learned some of the language. Like, kind of obvious. You say a few words, and then it's like, well, what do you know? We, we connect, things move. And listen, I wanted to pick your brain about some of the sort of Jewish tradition as well. I know you're kind of versed in some of that. It's something. I'm I'm uh, Jewish by proxy with several of my teachers obviously and mm-hmm. uh, so um i'm keen to pick your mind i've seen you do some beautiful illustrations of the embodiment of the star of david and yes. <laughs> you on me jamie uh, you got a good memory thank you <laughs> okay well i'll say i'll say a few things ready you'll love them uh you know i speak hebrew fluently so we'll just start with a word that everybody knows which is shalom mm-hmm. and shalom means peace it is the same word in Arabic, salam. It's the same root word. And so we go in those salam languages. Salam in Ethiopian. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, yeah. And we go, yeah, exactly. But we go into the root letters, uh, the root meaning, which is how those languages are constructed. So the SLM or SHLM, shalom, salam. And what those letters mean, the root meaning is wholeness. So peace comes from wholeness. And wholeness is what we're talking about, this unification of these seeming opposites, et cetera. And when we have that wholeness, when you and I is starting out as, as uh, enemies or in conflict and we can find a way to blend and, and come back to wholeness, we have peace. Yeah. Um, the word for perfection is mushlam. You can hear that shalom in perfection. And that's when things are together, which leads to the next thing, which is a concept in Judaism called tikkun olam. 
Mm-hmm. A lot of people have heard of it, even if you're not Jewish. It's become sort of a popularized notion, which I think is fabulous. Tikkun means to fix. If I was going to fix my car, you do tikkunim, right? So it just means to fix. Tikkun olam, olam is the world. Yeah, like heal the and, world is the kind of concept, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, so it's called repair of the world. And we know that our world is, shall we say, broken. It's almost more broken now than ever. We do not have wholeness. We have so much division. Um, I mean, we can go, we start with separation in this body from the one, right? We're in the separate body and we don't realize we're, we're one. That's like the spiritual enlightenment path. But just as different, again, different labels, nationalities, you and I are different, right? Boy, girl, age, country, whatever. Um, so uh, this repair of the world, tikkun olam, is really what we're, we're about. And this is just, a, it, it would be like a Hebrew way to express what Osense was teaching, which is basically we're all human beings are one family. And, and that's what we're really trying to do here. And then we come to a place of wholeness and peace, and we could start to have sort of heaven on earth instead of all this war and suffering and everything that we've got. So that would be tikkun olam. Another beautiful thing in Hebrew is about how we say to pay attention. Mm-hmm. So we say, I like, pay attention, yeah? I like, put some dollar bills on it or something. We pay attention. But in Hebrew, they say lasim lev. Lasim means to put, and lev is your heart. So mm-hmm. you'll even hear, hear parents you know, yelling at their kids, you know, sim lev, put your heart to it. And I always hear it as that, you know, put your heart to it, come on. So that's that. Those are some concepts that I think that we really work with. That's how we pay attention is to really put our heart and put our body. In. Yeah, I know Hebrew, Hebrew and Yiddish as well. I've come across quite a bit from some of my teachers and this, both languages have all sorts of juicy words and concepts and phrases. And, um, you know, I've seen people take embodiment apart almost Kabbalistically and yeah. this, this rich learning tradition in Judaism Mm-hmm. Uh, which sometimes is very, very cerebral. You know, the Jewish intellectual, yeah. the number of Nobel Prizes Jews have won is like vastly outstripping the percentage mm-hmm. of the world population they are. Um, and this intellectual tradition, this kind of arguing tradition that we see. And I, I've wondered why several of the sort of top embodiment teachers uh, that I've known have been Jewish. Also, you know, there's the Jubus, the sort of Jewish meditation teachers as well. Mm-hmm. There's disproportionately mm-hmm. represented in, in kind of American Buddhism as well. Um, so I'm wondering what the connection is between so many kind of Jewish teachers in, in these fields. Well, you kind of said it. I don't know whether you knew it or not, but when you said this Kabbalistic notion, yeah. Ikun Olam really is a Kabbalistic notion. It's from the more mystical branch of Judaism and the, the Hasidim, yeah. uh, who are Orthodox Jews. But this was several centuries ago, and where the Hasidic Kabbalistic mystical tradition really started to come into practice was through the Hasidim. And at that time, a couple hundred years ago, they were like, you know what, this is too cerebral. This is too in the head. And they wanted more uh, experience and mystical experience. And that came through the body. So they started to sing and dance. Uh, yeah, and you're still that rocking like, in front of the wailing wall. It's very visceral. You know, the body's it's very moving. Very physical. Rhythm. But they dance. I mean, it's just melodies. Yeah, it's and in the yeah, airport. I mean, you know, the hands and circles. And, I mean, it's, an, it's, it's a physical, it's a somatic expression. And this is going on today. So if you've got, say, a certain orthodoxy that's more sitting and studying, and then you've got this orthodoxy that's like singing and dancing and having this, you know, sort of mystical, mystical experience, like the Sufis, the whirling dervishes, yeah. right? So yeah. you get this mystical uh, uh, part of more orthodox practice in, in these religions, and it, it becomes very somatic, and it becomes very... Uh, you know, singing and dancing and playing music and, and holding hands and making circles and, uh, and really getting evolutionary about say, it. This is evolutionary sense of the continued revelation though, right? The continuous uh, development and, and, and how it's okay to develop things, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, and that, that seems to be in the innovative quality of some of the Jewish teachers. I know like you and Paul and, you know, Don and people like that has always, yeah. always fascinated me. Well, I think, you know, there's been a hunger in Judaism for, for the embodiment part of it. One of the, one of the sufferings of the Jewish people for 2000 years and, and all was to not be able to own land and, and to kind of uh, become merchants, become studiers, you know, in the mind students and yeah. not get to have that full experience. And part of the idea of, uh, of the state of Israel or, you know, having a, a state again was that we wanted to have farmers and janitors and musicians and, and have an embodied life. And that was, yeah. That's really, and in fact, underlying this drive for a state 
um, or underlying the Palestinian national movement. It's like we need land. Yeah, <laughs> we need like, physical yeah. land and we need yeah. to yeah. have a place where we physically express every aspect of yeah. life. We can't be separated off and only allowed a certain you know, way that we can operate or be that is disconnected. We have to have the whole experience and it begins with physical land. Yeah. So, so, so from the enforced cognitive to the lack of homeland and then to the like really wanting a physical place to stand and also this sense of mm-hmm. safety, you know, coming out of the Holocaust and this, this, the, you know, what could be more physical than that? Yeah. Like wanting to be somewhere safe. And think about it, when people are uprooted, their ground is taken yep. away physically. I mean, refugees, immigrants, I mean, it's, it's tough. Yep. We need that. Human beings need these things. Can we, can we talk um, about gender a little bit? I, I want to go, the, yeah, I don't want to miss the, uh, the Magin David, the Star of David. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please do. This is fine. You, so you remembered this. it. You get credit for it. I'm this is like impressed. eight years ago or something. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you actually paid more attention than I knew. Okay, this is no, I, I listen more than it looks, Jamie. Don't be. I fooled. guess so. Okay, I gotta stand up for this. So um, not everyone's gonna see this. This is one of my jokes about uh, why golf is uh, such a Jewish sport. <laughs> Ready? So here we are in, in golf. We're standing. You can't really see all of me, but um, you know, we're standing like this, and it turns out that. Uh, if you look at the way we stand in golf, we are forming from the bottom between the feet and it comes up through the legs and to here. So we have this triangle from the bottom between our two feet up our legs comes to the center. So we have this triangle like this from the bottom. And then from the top, you can see my shoulders down my arms is a triangle. So what we really have is two intersecting triangles. And in no other sport that I know of do we actually stand in a Jewish star, two intersecting and triangles. This, this, the triangles represent sort of masculine, feminine, yin, yang, heaven and earth, as I understand it. Is that right? The sort of balance between the two of them? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I love the way Baris Sensei, who I originally went to Russia with, uh, describes it. He talks about from that, that triangle from the, between the feet up, that that is earth's ascending energy. And the triangle from here down is heaven's descending energy. Yeah. Yeah. And then they intersect. And if you think about um, a Star of David, so we have this and that. And in the middle, I like to think of is the sort of um, Buddhist hara. So we have the nice. center, the hara in the middle of, uh, you know, heaven's descending energy, earth's ascending energy, intersecting with this center. And then going in, in, in an organized fashion... Uh, into pretty much every direction and this star that kind of embodies all of that, which is pretty cool. And ascending and descending is a nice distinction, isn't it? You see that in certain arts, to like paganism is all earthy and downwards, and rah, you know, having sex in the mud. And then like <laughs> ascending is, you know, the Buddhist trying to, or the Christian trying to sort of meditate their way out of it all or pray their way up <laughs> and they're looking up to heaven. And, and then that's sort of where they kind of meet is, 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 is the real deal, you know, where those, both of those things are happening simultaneously. Uh, well, also, I mean, to me, that's planet earth. I mean, and that's what yeah. each of us is. We're this place where it meets. We're this place that has to somehow negotiate this earth experience with this heaven that <laughs> wherever we come from or whatever we call it. And, you know, we got to get those two together and that's the whole thing. Um, life in a body. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. That would kind of be it. And, and we're the place where that happens. And yeah, the, the meeting about us as humans, we do it with, with consciousness because we have this this brain, supposedly, <laughs> this, this higher level of... Hopefully. Right, you know, supposed it at this point. It doesn't seem that way sometimes, does it? And, <laughs> and can you say something a little about like the women's martial arts work you've done? That's a place I haven't seen you, of course, work. I know you've done women's martial arts conference, been involved with... Uh, Maybe you could bring in some of the sort of gay rights work you've done or your brother does and the connections there. Um, yeah, yeah. if you're willing to talk a little bit about those two sides of things. Sure. Well, when I started training, it was kind of mid-late 70s, and that, of course, was the real first strong, strong era of women's liberation, gay liberation. And I, when I was sort of blue belt, brown belt, I met some women who were tradeswomen, they had a company, actually seven sisters. They were electricians and carpenters and uh, <clears throat> plumbers. They were doing doing um, uh, that kind of work, and they were training in different martial arts, Shotokan Karate, a Korean martial art called Kuk Sul Wan, 
I was doing Aikido when I met them. There were some pe people doing Tai Chi. And we were just young women. We were all in our you know, early, mid-20s. And we went, oh, what do you, you do a martial art? That's cool. And what do you do? What do you do? So we started going to a, a camp, a really rustic camp in the Sierras out here in California. And we would just get together just to train and go, well, what do you do? What do you do? And we just very naturally, spontaneously started to share our martial arts with each other. And then we would do a little performance <laughs> um, in the evening and, and really show the art. I remember I was a brown belt and there was a woman who just got her black belt in karate from uh, Oregon. And we would sit around, people go, oh, at Aikido, that's really pretty, that's neat, but well, what if, what if, you know those questions, well, what, yeah, if, yeah. what if I did this? And when all of a sudden this black belt karate woman starts like punching me and kicking me, I'm totally unprepared for this, in the middle of the conversation, yeah? And what did I do? I just sort of got off the line, I'd extend my hand, I'd sort of do something. She was falling down all over the place and I never got hit. And I was like, wow, this Aikido, <laughs> this is pretty cool, this works. But um, it was really great to, those were our initial very spontaneous gatherings. And it evolved into uh, here on the West Coast, what we call the Pacific Association of Women Martial Artists. It's a nonprofit. We just had our 40 year camp. We have a camp every year. And uh, it's organized kind of by class periods and we hire different uh, instructors. So say in the morning, you'll have two or three class periods, a couple of different instructors you can choose. So you could do something that's within your art, maybe judo for me, judo, jujitsu, a mat art, or I could do something totally else. I could do Tai Chi. I could do, learn to kick. I could spar and they, uh, they can learn rolling and falling skills or joint techniques. I mean, we can really share our, our arts with each other, which is really awesome. And then I discovered that there were on the, the same thing was happening during that era, late 70s, of women's empowerment, take back the night, self-defense, uh, dealing with rape, et cetera. Um, it was happening on the East Coast, and it's called the National Women's Martial Arts Federation. So I started teaching there, I think, uh, around 87. I'd already had my dojo for six or seven years. And my dojo grew out of those first camps. I started mm -hmm. it uh, February 3rd, 1980. We did some women's martial arts performances like we were doing out in the Sierras at camp. We said, we should do this and show this to the public. So in 79 and 80 in Berkeley we and in San Francisco, we held these these performances. And they were on stage in an auditorium. We had like a 1,000 people coming. They were packed they were sold out it was a phenomenon and aikido by the way it would be the grand finale usually because of rondori our multiple attack which is just so yeah so there's an aesthetic to that isn't there it's, it's fun to watch yeah. yeah magic and you know that's when people ask me to teach and i was like no i'm, I'm a baby black belt i'm young we can't do that separate and uh, i don't have any money <laughs> i don't get, to get get a studio or mats but you know, some stories. And I started the women's Aikido school by around 86, seven, I changed it to the Aikido art center and it became <clears throat> men and women, but training with women instructors, which was totally unusual. And, yeah. and kids no, I've been to a few, excuse me. I've been to a few dojos with his female instructions and it just, just that will encourage more female students I've seen. And um, sometimes kind of change the atmosphere to, to how it can be more, more kind of positive in that light. Well, it's a woman-led world instead of a man-led world, and almost everywhere is a man-led world, so it's it's different. It's got kind of a different quality and uh, wonderful. I mean, I was very happy I opened it up to men, women, kids. Um, also, you know, we would keep women-only classes because there's something really important about that as well. But anyway, so I've, you know, I'm kind of a senior instructor for these organizations now. In 19, eh, late 90s, I helped to co-found the Israel Women's Martial Arts Federation, um, um, and uh, that's going very strong thanks to the leadership of uh, Yudit Sidikman over there and, and many others. It's, they do a lot of self-defense, monologuing training. They teach different martial arts. I have a, a building. It, it's fantastic, really. So, uh, And then in 1998, I co-founded the Association of Women Martial Arts Instructors and because we realized that people don't necessarily get any education in how to teach, uh, there's so many issues in how to teach and then they also don't get any instruction in how to be a business owner. So this yeah. is really yeah, 1998. So we have been, we're in our 19th year this year uh, of, of our annual teaching the teaching conference. <clears throat> and it's for mostly black belt women and women who are instructing maybe in their, in, in the school they're in, but also you'd be surprised how many women, uh, women martial arts, uh, dojo cho owners there are. And there's so many, 
so many parts of being a business owner and basically an entrepreneur. So we have classes and all those things. We meet for two and a half days and some are workouts. Most of them are um, sort of classroom things. And, oh, it's been so empowering. And we really supported each other. For me, I will say it's been a training grounds to be a teacher that enabled me to sort of go national and international. It's been a huge training grounds. It's also, um, uh, you know, just it, it makes such a difference to – uh, be exposed to each other's martial arts to not only know about your martial art, but to be aware of the broader martial arts. Yeah, the art. cross-pollination, it seems to that, I mean, gender stuff aside, that, that that's a great thing, right? Like, it's it's quite common for karate people never to have done Aikido or Aikido people never to have done Judo. And mm-hmm. I find that strange in the modern world when there's so much available, but people still live in their silos a little bit often, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's really, I think it's really enriched me as a, as a martial artist in general, and even as an Aikidoist, because I've had so much exposure. And that's just because we got together as women, women martial artists across borders, shall we say. And I mean, I think men should be doing that. And I think there should be more instruction in Aikido and probably in every martial art about being an instructor, about being a school owner. I mean, they're People don't always know how to teach, do they? People can be a great martial artist or a great dancer or a great yogi, but not necessarily have much experience uh, actually training even mm-hmm. in teaching. You know, I'm a real teaching snob. I'm from a family of teachers, and that's something I've really, really looked at. And, uh, you know, it's teaching, teaching just yesterday, actually. But, um, <laughs> you know, someone can be a really great practitioner of an art and know all the moves, but not be able to convey them. Uh, even exactly. in football, you see that the best football players don't become the best football managers. That's, that's yeah, that's it, it's play. not. It's, yeah, it's not automatic. It really takes it takes conscious education. And uh, a very good friend of mine, Dara Macy, she's Shihan. She is the, she inherited the leadership of Hakuryu Jiu Jitsu from Dennis Palumbo, who, who passed away. Her teacher. So we have a woman who is the world head of Hakuryu Jiu Jitsu Federation. And she and I have been uh, friends and colleagues since you know so we met at we met back east at the National Women's Martial Arts Federation years ago. And um, she called me one one early morning. She waited in New York till I woke up in California and said, "We got to do this." So we we together co-founded the Association of Women Martial Arts Instructors, and um, you know it's going strong. I, I would like to see more more women take advantage of of these organizations because they're so powerful. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and I think that I, I've tried actually to bring that model into the Aikido world. I think we need it more in Aikido, frankly. Yeah. Nice. Okay, we do need to wrap this up. I could talk to you for another few hours. Oh, Let's politics. Go. I got to say a word about politics. Uh, you know, given, given that you're in America right now, I think that's fair. So let's say <laughs> let's, let's a little bit about politics before we wrap this up. But- well, you mentioned my dear brother, um, and he just was turned out as California State Senator. He was chair of the Budget Committee, of the State of California. I'm very proud of him. We look alike, you know. Um, hmm. But uh, and he did the keynote talk a couple years ago for our Ike Extensions National Conference that we held in Palo Alto about sort of political Aikido, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's running for mayor of San Francisco. Election isn't until 2019, but he's. Uh, I would say the front runner for that, but he is incredibly well loved, respected. Works across party lines, as uh, even as a sort of liberal Democrat, he is respected across the aisle, and really tries to um, work work in this way where we can find find ways where it's such odds. We have we can't stay like this. You know, we can't stay like this. We just can't. And yeah, how, the division, huh? Oh, how painful it is, how unsustainable it is. And it's reaching, I mean, it's at such extreme extremes right now in our country and in our, in our world. And so bringing this sort of ethic uh, into the, into political life and starting to say, Hey, we can't, we can't just be like this and I smush you and we just hate each other. And mm-hmm. we're enemies. Mm-hmm. This is so unsustainable and it's unsustainable for the planet. So kind of a, a taking, looking at those principles. And it was fun when I asked him to, to be the keynote speaker and he agreed for him, it was a really interesting process to think about what he does, that he does Aikido in the political realm, mm-hmm. which is not easy to do. And this is why he is, has been, I think, as successful as he has and why he is, um, relatively speaking, I mean, there are people who are his detractors, but relatively speaking, he is amazingly well-loved and respected. And he has foremost uh, the humanity 
of what politics is, of what anything is. This isn't just yeah. politics. This is policy is about real people and having having um, intelligent compassion and making that somatic difference in people's lives. I mean, having uh, having housing, having healthcare, having education, uh, having freedom. These are somatic things. These are our lives. Life mm. is is that, and that that's what. That's what policy is. That's what politics really is. It's not money and power and, and all of that um, and, and ideology and partisanship. This is this is real people's real lives, and that's what we're doing. And that's what he takes foremost and tries to find ways to find where we can get together and do something that makes a real difference in real people's lives. Now, I know he's not an Aikidoka, but I'm sure he's been influenced by his sister. I'm sure he wouldn't have it any other way, Jamie, knowing you. So, um, I mean, is he one of the only kind of senator level or that senior level politicians in the States who has been influenced by embodiment? I mean, I'm wondering if there's any others out there who have a yoga practice. I mean, we have Justin up in Canada who's a yoga practitioner. I mean, I'm wondering if there's any other sort of that politicians at that level who are influenced by this paradigm. You know, I wish I knew the answer. That would be a, a good thing to research. Um, anecdotally, I, you know, I do find that there, there's a, there is a sort of um, a consciousness like that or uh, mm. enlightenment like that. You find that people are doing something uh, who, who have that ethic that they are doing, whether it's some kind of meditation or, or how they run. Maybe they're doing Zen running or something like that. It's to go back to what I'm trying to do with the Kiai way and why I take this uh, into golf or take it into the business world or take it into areas of conflict. It's like saying, you know what, this applies, <laughs> this applies and how we do business, how we hit a golf ball, how yep. we are, how we, how we, you know, relate, how we love our kids or our partners, how we, our communities. I mean, this is all completely relevant. And when we can bring this into what we're doing, then we start to be uh, agents and uh, and places of transformation in every every field and every aspect of daily life and daily interaction. That way, we start to make a bigger ripple effect. And if we can bring different ethic and really embody values, and then bring them to how we operate, all these jobs that we're doing, these things we're, we're accomplishing every day. I mean, how I hit a golf ball is going to be how I do everything, right? And and. Uh, and to make that transformation in the business world, I think is really important. In fact, the way I I got into doing corporate work was just from a meditation about 10 years ago in San Diego. I'm just kind of doing my meditation and I hear this thing waft through my mind that says, you've got to get these teachings, this key I go, if I yeah. go these teachings out to people of quote power and influence. And yeah. of course I knew about elected officials and I thought, okay, there's elected officials, there's business corporate leaders. Yeah, who runs the world? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, it's like, that's where, that's when I started to move in that direction and go, I want to make a difference here so that we're not into this uh, just competitive, stressed out dog eat dog business world that we need to, yeah. uh, we need to make a difference there. I mean, that's a workplace for so many people every day, but you know, it's, business kind of really runs the world, money talks and, um, rather than demonizing that, 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 you know, imperfect as it is that world actually working, you know, I, I started working in business just because I wanted some money. I was like, Hey, I want to use completely selfish reason. I was just like, I want to make some money. I don't want to just try and sell to hippies who are broke. And, uh, and then I got into it and within a year or two, I was doing some jobs. I remember one time I was working at quite a, with a fairly senior level group in a, one of the world's biggest companies. And I did some somatic work with them. And uh, it went pretty well. And it was about stress or something, I think. And then afterwards, they said, hey, why don't you hang around? We're kind of having our, you know, you can sit in on the rest of our meeting to inform the next time you come here, you know. And I sat around and I saw the kind of decisions these guys were making in terms of, the, you know, opening a dozen factories in China or, you know, laying off a million jobs or, you know, whatever it was, the working conditions for thousands of people in Switzerland or Germany or wherever it was. And I was like, wow, these guys are making huge decisions every day. And it's like, if I've influenced them positively, Mm -hmm. even a bit with what I just did. And I think I had, you know, they were having conversations about corporate social responsibility and diversity and which apparently they didn't normally have because they're more in touch with their body and therefore their values. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, if I'm influencing these guys just a little bit. Yeah. I'm having on the world today <laughs> is, is more than I'm having the rest of the year, you know, just because yeah. the kind of scales they were dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I can, I can see that's also a way to sort of heal the world and make the world a better place. If it's not too cheesy. Um, listen, Jamie, we need to wrap up. So what's, what's your final message about the body for the world? So closing message about the body for everyone on the podcast. 
Oh, closing message. Well, what can I say? I mean, it's where we are. It's where we live. It's what we got. Uh, let's love it. Let's honor it. Let's learn to use it. And uh, actually, I would like to get everything we're talking about into first grade. And what I mean by that is we talk about our children, but when we teach our kids reading, writing, arithmetic, what mm -hmm. I try to do with kids and my uh, dream, I guess, a vision is to have Aiki Kiai in first grade. So here's reading, writing, arithmetic. Here's who am I? I am life energy in a body. This is my body. And it works. I have four faculties. I have four ways it works. It works through what I think and what I feel and how I, what I eat and what I do and my spirit, what I love, what I just, you know, passionate about. And who's in charge of my energy? I am. <laughs> and how does it work? Through my center and my legs and my breath. And, you know, we teach them this stuff. This is generic. You outfit you them. Kids this. Yeah, you can teach, you them, teach like little a kids to, that, that they're the master of their energy in this body for this lifetime. And then whatever they love. I mean, they could love soccer. They could love, they, it doesn't matter what they love. And, um, you know, they'll be 95 years old learning how to, how to, play an instrument, whatever they're doing. And they're, it's, this is what they are going to do through their whole life. And that everybody is life energy in a body. And that, that relationship is about relating at that level with one another and with this, this uh, world full of life energy. So, you know, the vision would be, uh, it's never too late. We're all kids and it's never too late for any of us at any age. It makes a giant difference. Uh, we'll transform when we start to know this and practice it. But boy, if we could, teach our kids this in, in first grade and they were outfitted that way. What a gift to give them for their own lives and for, for the world. Beautiful vision. Thank you, Jamie. And if people want to find out more about you, they can go to the key I I believe that's the K I A I way.com the key I Any mm -hmm. other places you want to point people to? Uh, well, they can always email me, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, Jamie J A M I E Z. For Jamie Zimron, Jamie Z Sensei, S E N S E I at gmail.com. Jamie Z Sensei, Gmail is an easy one. And uh, anybody who wants to call in the States or from anywhere, 760 492 4653. Wow, you're giving out your phone number. Literally, giving out my phone number because I like to talk to people and I'm, I'm responsive. And, and, yeah, okay. so that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's been fun. I do need to head out now. So Jamie, this has been vibrant. It's been juicy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all your listeners. Thanks for doing this. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embodied Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body. <laughs>